Hey, welcome back to another uh, dispatch from Holly McKay. Ho We're going to do a video today. And um, so you get to see Holly this time, which is a, a little bit different from podcasts. Welcome, Holly. Hi. There you go. Um, so uh, today we got a two-parter. We're going we're to do part one uh, because you've got a story here on your recent trip to Guantanamo Bay. And uh, so for part one, let's uh, just dive in and get started. What... Um, What's the gist of this one? What did you find? So I had the opportunity to go to Guantanamo Bay. Um, we all know that it's sort of the island uh, that is Cuban, but Americans have occupied that for a long time and probably for a long time to come. And not only is it a naval base, but it is also where at one point about 700 to 800 uh, detainees from all over the world that were suspected of being involved in terrorist activities uh, were sort of put there after the attacks of 9-11. Of um, it was a very controversial decision at the time um, because people did not want, or lawmakers did not want to bring these detainees onto American shore, which would have enabled them the constitutional rights that we have. Um, so this was sort of brought as, a, as an alternative, but it's been very controversial over the years because so many of the detainees haven't been uh, subject to due process. Um, a lot of them have sort of been released and then gone back to the battlefield. Um, so it's just, it's kind of been a messy place. And so uh, the time that I was there um, just a couple of weeks ago, it was to look at the pretrial of a man, a man named Abd al-Rahim al-Nashiri. And he is a Saudi national, but primarily I uh, lived a lot in Yemen. And he's sort of the mastermind of the really brutal USS Cole bombing in Yemen that happened in 2000. And it's sort of been overshadowed quite a bit um, because of 9-11 and because the sort of the 9-11 fire are also still at Gitmo. Um, but I thought this was a really sort of important case to look at uh, from multiple lenses, one being that, um, you know, this attack happened in 2000, and, and this was a man who was who was pretty quickly brought into custody, I believe it was around 2002, and um, and he's sort of been languishing uh, without sort of any real conviction since then. But what also makes it interesting is that he is one of the two cases that is up for the death penalty, um, so that uh, Nishiri being one, and then the other death penalty case that's currently on the table is the 9-11-5. Uh, um, so this was just a really interesting case to look at from multiple perspectives. And I just wanted to highlight too that it's a pre-trial, it's not a trial, and sort of the pre-trial is taking different witnesses and testimony and then trying to determine will the case go to trial or will there be a plea deal? Um, so this sort of just shows you the, the snail pace at which this is all, run, all operating, given that this, as I said, happened in the year 2000. Yeah, there we go. So that's 22 years ago. And um, there you are at Gitmo, and you're watching this trial. The, the, the article that the people are reading to go along with this particular video describes a very snail's pace. Mm. of this pretrial process. Um, tell us a little bit about, you know, what that was like to be there watching it happen. Yeah, I mean, so it's a, it's a really interesting experience. So the area where these military tribunals happen is a place called Camp Justice in Guantanamo Bay. Um, and you've got sort of a little um, a courthouse, if you will, that's on the hill. Um, and then we sort of have an MOC and it's it's fairly heavily fortified and a very eerily quiet place to be, to be quite honest with you. Um, so we all sort of go in and then um, there was just a couple of media there and, and media and also family members of those who have died. Um, I believe that it was about uh, 17 US um, sailors that were killed in this attack. So basically what happened is uh, the USS Cole, a Navy ship, had stopped in the port of Aden to refuel and uh, Al-Qaeda as it was and, and Nishiri was um, alleged to have been sort of one of the Al-Qaeda leaders in Yemen and, and quite uh, close to Osama bin Laden as well um, and they sort of masterminded this attack where just literally like a, like a small um, boat came up with suicide bombers and of course you know blew up the U.S. naval ship and, and caused a huge amount of, of casualties at that point so that was sort of uh, very much a precursor to 9-11, if you will, in terms of um, Al-Qaeda really being on 
uh, America's radar as this uh, concerning terrorist organization and that was operating not just in Afghanistan, but also, you know, as you see in Yemen, in the Gulf, um, and, and much throughout the Middle East. So that was very much an indicator. And so in this trial, it's really, um, it's interesting because you, you're in this little back area um, at the back of the courthouse and it's this sort of um, glass you know, soundproof room. So you can't actually hear what's happening in the courthouse other than there are these monitors with speakers, but they're 40 seconds or late. So you're sort of looking at one thing happening in the courtroom and then you're sort of looking at the monitor and it's 40 seconds out. And that is because um, the agency, when I say the agency, the CIA is still monitoring um, the proceedings. And so anything that may be um, potentially uh, Concerning from their end, from a sort of a classification point of view, um, they sort of have that 40 second maneuverability to cut the feed on that so that we as as civilians who are not sort of subject to the security clearances um, don't uh, can't hear exactly what's happening. So it's a it's a very strange dynamic to begin with. And then adding to that since COVID, which has also caused huge delays in these trials, you've got um, it's a very hybrid sort of situation where so much of the testimony and a number of both the prosecution and the defense are in a room in Virginia um, that are being broadcast live their testimony and then you've got but you've got the judge and then you've got some prosecution and some defense that are are in the courtroom as well as well as the defendant Nishiri who is there so it's a very a very strange system uh, the military tribunal itself is sort of a a bit of a hybrid system um, a little bit of a hybrid of both um, the way that uh, you know military uh, the U.S. military conducts its tribunals and then you've got a little bit of the American system in there and a little bit of the international system. So it's this uh, very different, if you will, um, judicial system. Um, but it was, you know, for me, I think, being able to sort of have this firsthand look at what is going on, and it's frustrating to see this, the slowness of it. And it's hard, I think, for, you know, for, for even me who's sort of analyzing it, um, to really understand how this can be sort of continuing. And, and being there, I think, Dennis, I had a little bit more of an idea of why it's so slow. I mean, everything is just, is sort of painfully drawn out. Um, sometimes that, you know, and the judge has been very good about trying to be as open as possible, but often they will go into a closed session, even when discussing a document that has been unclassified, um, just out of concerns of anything else coming up in that process. Um, you've also got, you know, for one example, um, there was a a lawyer that is assigned to the defense um, several years ago, and obviously Nashiri, the defendant, has built quite a rapport with this particular lawyer, um, but yet the lawyer has been requesting to get off the case because he worked on the case that was quite pro high profile of another um, person involved in the USS Cole bombing, um, I think going back to 2008. Um, so that's like sort of a clear conflict of interest from my you know, non-lawyer standpoint. Um, but at this point, you know, Nashiri has developed a rapport with him, but is also concerned about the, the conflict of interest. And at the end of the day, he's the one who has to sort of sign off on um, the approval, so to speak, of this particular lawyer being taken off his case. Um, yet at the same time, the defense wants to keep him. And then the question is, why was he put on the case in the first place when he clearly represented somebody who was likely in a position to have given a lot of information about Nishiri that cannot be used anyway because of the conflict. Um, so, you know, they went, for example, one afternoon where you know, the entire afternoon was sort of devoted to deliberating upon this and still there was no conclusion to it. So, um, you know, I think the judge is quite frustrated and, and certainly just for me as a court observer, a lot of what sort of happens there is is a little bit head scratching to me. Yeah. So, and this has been going on for 22 years, essentially, mm. because this guy was caught pretty early on. Yes. Right? Yeah. So, um, so last question for, for this particular uh, installment. Um, did you get any sense that anyone there is really in a hurry to let this, to, to, to get this thing solved? Or is this basically let it go forever kind of strategy yeah, going on yeah, in the that, background. That is sort of a little bit of my feeling is, you know, how long will this be drawn out for? Um, because 
there isn't a great solution to it. I would be quite doubtful that, you know, Nashiri would be even if found guilty issued the death penalty. I think that would bring about a huge appeals case. Um, I also believe that um, nobody really wants to see, you know, if he is, of course, found guilty, nobody wants to see somebody like that who killed Americans to just sort of be released, um, for lack of a better word, of trying to, quote, unquote, close Gitmo. Um, and there just isn't, there isn't a lot of, uh, there's just so much debate either way. And a huge factor that I sort of found in a lot of it was, the issue with the the black sites, which of course you know a lot of that has been made public, um, and in the in the very sort of fear stricken state that America was in after nine eleven, um, the agency had sort of established these black sites in many different countries around the world, and these were often where some of these uh, terror alleged terrorists who were taken to Gitmo were first taken to um, be interrogated, and a lot has sort of come out about this enhanced interrogation techniques, which a lot of people also believe was just plain torture. Um, so that has also caused a really big quagmire within the way that the court system is running because there is this big debate that that essentially that evidence really can't be used and whatever that they may have said during these uh, sessions um the argument of course is that this was um you know confessions that may have been made under torture um which is you know illegal in the international law so that's a lot of back and forth and in this case it's sort of unique because the judge hasn't come right out and sort of said you cannot use any testimony that was obtained during these um, interrogations but at the same time you have just such a massive outcry from the international community on that front um, so it's really just it's just so many challenges that are, are in with this sort of all around um, that are going to are going to make it hard I think to have sort of a solid conviction. And certainly if the prosecution is pushing for death penalty, um, I think that will be, you know, from their point of view, uh, quite, a, quite a challenge. Yeah. Well, it sounds problematic uh, given the, I mean, just, I mean, now you've got my curiosity on that one with the, if, and, and, and this guy was held at black sites, correct? Yes, he was. And of course, okay. um, his, his chief legal counsel, who I, who I met with the, Anthony Natale, you know, said that since then he's been uh, suffering from a lot of psychological trauma. He has what is called learned helplessness, which means you're just sort of saying yes, yes, yes uh, to any questions that you're asked. And so that is sort of an argument that the defense is going with very heavily. Yeah. So that that. Yeah. So you've got uh, testimony obtained under duress in the doesn't quite fit international law and uh and may not even fit u.s law from from that standpoint in terms of uh admissibility in in even military court um it sounds like a terrible mess and um how many people are left that are in this kind of terrible mess situation at guantanamo at this point uh i have to get the number correct i think it's uh late 20s i think or maybe 30 32 i believe is the number of detainees left i believe 12 are cleared for uh for release um but they still have not been released so that again shows you uh some of the the big challenges that are with uh, sort of closing guantanamo so to speak yeah there we go all right well that's an up um um a tumultuous well not tumultuous but uh a um a a a kind of a tortuous from a mental um, anguish standpoint, long yeah. held things. And, and as you said, there are family members that are uh, still to this day, 22 years later, showing up in court to watch the proceedings. Um, thank you, Holly. And uh, we'll see you again next time. Thank you, Dennis.